Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Gaming Tidicom video, we're going to be discussing tech news which has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. There are two primary subjects for the video. The first is a dual Vega card, which supposedly Asus are producing, and the second is Ryzen and Linux, because according to one website, Linux and Ryzen have a bit of a problem together. There are there are some crashes which can occur in under specific workloads and circumstances. We'll get to that in a minute. First of all, the dual Vega 64s. So, as we all know, Vega is going to be released over the next several weeks. We're going to see, you know, first of all, the introduction of reference design cards, and then after that, AIB partners, of course, are going to release a myriad of different GPUs starting with the more, you know, not exactly reference cards, but nothing too crazy, all the way until they're basically are attaching nuclear reactors to the cards. So, with that said, now AIB partners have already, you know, been working on these for a couple of weeks. It's not surprising that we started to hear some ideas that Asus and MSI and all these other companies are already playing with. Well, here's what's quite interesting. According to a website by the name of WCCF Tech, Asus are deciding to reignite the Ares series of cards, well, at least of sorts. For those who don't know, the ROG Ares 2 was a dual HD 7970. Yeah, going back a bit, right? Now, this card had a dual um, 7970 core. So, in other words, there were two 7970s essentially strapped onto the same PCB and operated at around 600 watts which is quite an awful lot of energy. In fact, in power draw tests, according to Tom's hardware, with a Crisis 2 loop, it hit 400 watts, just over, whereas if it had a full GP-GPU workload, it was over 600 watts. So getting back to the present, RX Vega, according to these rumours, if they are accurate, we're going to be looking at two of these cards essentially bolted on to the same PCB. Now, what type of level of performance? Well, obviously we don't know exactly, but in theory at least, in theoretical land, we're looking at 25 teraflops of FP32 performance or 50 teraflops of FP16, which is pretty damn insane. Now, of course, this card is not going to be cheap on the power bill. In fact, this card is also rated at around 600 watts, possibly slightly more. I mean, you don't have to be a mathematical genius or to really investigate this card too much to kind of guess that, given what we know about the other Vega 10 cards anyway. So, whether this is a full Vega 10 or a Vega 10 XL, in other words, a 56 compute unit or a 64 compute unit chip, we're not too sure. There is also a few other questions which really just baffle me. The first, well, the most obvious are, well, are they really going to be producing this? I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised because... It technically would be the first, oh, sorry, the fastest single card on the planet, in theory. But the other issue is that this actually conflicts with what AMD have said in the past. Well, I say in the past, and it's actually very recent. I actually have a video up on the channel just a few days ago. Basically, AMD have said that they're not cutting the, um, I, I guess, R&D for Crossfire, as in like they're cutting off and stopping it, because some people are misreporting that, some people are saying that they're basically AMD are done with it, and you might as well say it's a legacy feature. No, they're not doing that. It's, it's essentially that they're winding it down, they're reducing emphasis on it. Now, there are multiple reasons supposedly that this is happening. One of those is because they want the Apis to really push this, and I was DirectX 12 and Vulkan. The second is that there are only a certain number of customers who can afford this. I mean, okay, sure, it's very awesome to hear about these cards, like, you know, it's like these cards in Crossfire, like two or three or whatever cards. But the reality is that if you're plonking down like six or seven hundred bucks on a GPU, most people just can't afford it. The other thing is, by the time, if you let's say, for example, you bought a card now, just for the sake of argument, and you think, okay, well, in three to six months, I'll buy a new card because, you know, games by then will be struggling or my finances will be recovered, whatever. Most of the time, you just don't do it. Because by then, you've heard about another card which is popping out. There. Hell, there might be a Vega refresh. There might be the, the fabled and touted Pascal refresh. And you just think, eh, I could plonk this money down, but then I'm going to be essentially buying into old technology. So most people that have to do this, they, they buy them here and then. And most most people can't really afford to just plonk down like 1500 or 2000 US dollars or whatever the case may be for a graphics card. So AMD are not 
stopping crossfire support, but what they are doing is just reducing it because they feel that their resources would be better served on drivers. And to be fair, from what we've heard about Vega drivers, there is some room in the tank to improve that performance. So obviously, in their mind, if they can do that, if they can tweak the performance to better uh, serve a larger number of customers, that makes a great deal more sense. Obviously, that does leave the whole Asus thing into a bit of a weird weird gap. Does that mean they've come up with some hardware solution? Which is possible, given what we know about AMD and what they're working on. But obviously that would probably increase the cost. Or will Asus divert some of its resources, possibly to produce some uh, crossfire profiles or whatever else it has to do? Who knows? Or maybe it's just going to be one of those really nice, in theory, but in reality it's not really that great of a deal. Then again, I'm sure miners, in theory, will absolutely love this. So, let's talk about the next uh, story. This one comes to us from an individual who actually emailed this to me. His name is Jordan. Uh, I must admit, I'm not a particularly heavy uh, Linux user. Uh, that's not to say I've never used it in my life, but I just don't really use it that much in my day-to-day -day work, just because I just I, I can't. Most of the applications I'm running, or benchmarks I'm running, I just need Windows. Um, sorry, that might piss some people off, but it is what it is. Sorry about that. So, a website to buy, and I'm probably going to butcher the name, is Foronix. That is P H. That is P H. Excuse me, O R O N I X. I've linked it in the video description. Has told us that Ryzen tests and stress runs make it easy to cause segmentation faults on Zen CPUs. That's the headline. So what they've done um, is essentially run various heavy workloads, which they tell us consistently cause crashes in Ryzen. Now, I don't have the operating system myself installed to test this. I would suggest if you can, do some testing. Uh, give, me an, give me an email, paul at redgamingtech.com as well, if you've run into these same issues. I'm quite interested to hear. I've actually asked a couple of people I know on Facebook to do some testing as well. Anyway, according to the website, AMD haven't publicly commented on the problem, and as of Linux 4.13, the issue is still happening. If carrying out the same tests on Intel CPUs, the segmentation faults do not occur. There is even a Ryzen test that can easily try and reproduce the issue. The Ryzen test script will be will build, bloody hell I can't speak today, GCC in parallel loops from a compressed RAM disk in order to easily test the CPU. In my day-to-day -day benchmarking of Ryzen 5 CPU, in Ryzen CPUs, however, I haven't hit the problem with my main production desktop using Ryzen 5. The problem only comes into light just under very heavy and continuous workloads. Now, what he did is try this with a Ryzen 7 1800X with an MSI X. 370 X Power Titanium Gaming Motherboard. Too long, didn't read. Uh, he basically got crashes with Agasa uh, 1.0.0.6. This crash occurred in just 88 seconds, and this is with RAM speed at 3200 MHz. Now you're going to say, okay, well, it's because the RAM was overclocked, right? I mean, AMD can't guarantee that. Well, Apparently, even with the RAM speed at operating at the default clocks, which is 2133 MHz, the issue still occurred at 83 seconds. And if he disabled SMT, it takes longer for the problem to occur, but still does eventually happen. So, obviously, disabling SMT is not exactly the best solution, because while you're essentially saying, hey, I don't like that extra performance, that's, that's a nasty idea. Now, to be fair, and once again, I don't know a huge amount about Linux, but from what and my understanding is reading about this and kind of doing a bit of uh, searching around, it appears that basically it's not necessarily 100% AMD's fault. Some of it could be that, well, Ryzen is a new architecture, so it's probable that a lot of stuff was built with the idea of all well, Intel. So obviously it's pretty much just causing crashes, so hopefully patches or whatever else will fix the issue. Um, the reason I'm bringing this to people's attention is simply because I know some individuals who watch this channel are on Linux, and well, if obviously that's the case, I realize that some of you may be processing certain sensitive tasks, and I just want you to be aware of this, and you can do some testing, and obviously if, you know, we find out as a community, um, that there are issues or what's causing these issues, 
then obviously AMD and other companies, whomever else is producing the software or the issue which is causing it. I obviously don't want to point fingers because as I said, I've not done testing myself, so I have to be quite careful with my wording. Obviously, there may be a fix, and I don't want to put the blame on anyone. I would much rather just have a solution with this type of stuff anyway. So secondary um, piece of news. Uh, this is not the biggest piece of news, but it's still kind of cool. We are going to be looking at mobile Ryzen laptops for the holiday season. Now, it's kind of weird because you would expect AMD to really be hammering the laptop market right now. Given that, well, let's just be totally honest, laptops are kind of popular. Not so much. I mean, yes, of course, they have mobile plans, but they've been a lot cagier than what they have been for desktop. Well, accordingly, Ryzen Mobile AMD are now looking to really offer attractive solutions because, honestly, the best thing they've had previously are APUs, and let's just be totally blunt, they're not that great if you need to do high-end productivity tasks. So, accordingly to Fuzzilla anyway, we shall be looking for the mobile uh, Ryzen processors to be shipping to various vendors this holiday season in mass. Before you ask, no, we're probably not going to be seeing a Threadripper processor for the for the laptops because, well, I just don't even want to imagine how long the battery life would be on that thing. But it makes an awful lot of sense. Intel are basically pressuring the market right now. We've got the 8th generation uh, processors which are basically starting to filter out, not just for laptops, but of course we're going to start seeing them for desktop as well. So essentially AMD need to continue the pressure. As I've said before a few times now, Ryzen is a very impressive processor, and honestly, it kind of makes some of the uh, even high-end SKUs from Intel, like the 7800, kind of pointless, unless you really need the X299 platform for some particular reason. But Ryzen server basically nukes a lot of the point for that. So, I guess with... Intel releasing various Coffee Lake processors, including, of course, the 8700K, assuming it does end up being called the 8700K. According to leaks, that's what the name's going to be. That has six cores, 12 threads. I have a feeling that this year in tech is going to be absolutely bonkers. It's going to be absolutely crazy. One final piece of news, very titchy piece. Um, we are also going to be seeing RX Vega 56 ship in September 2. So that essentially means we're going to be looking at these cards available basically at the same time as when AIB partners start uh, getting their hands and releasing very uh, you know, tweaked versions of the Vega 64s. So it looks like Vega 64s, the standard editions, are going to be hitting store shelves on the 14th of August. But if you want the cheaper one, the $400 uh, RX Vega 56, that's going to be until September, just for your FYI. With all of that said, hopefully you have found this video informative and joyful to listen to. I shall see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.